Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Questioning Behaviour. My name is Marla and I'm here with my co-host Sarah. Hello and welcome to the podcast. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the dummy that don't... So obviously, as you are well aware, we are a behavioral science podcast. And today we are questioning the behavioral science of banking. Are you excited, Ooh. Sarah? Um, I Yes, I'm excited. Though I expect you are more excited than I am, right? This is your wheelhouse a little bit more. My wheelhouse. Mm, I study money. I suppose you could argue I uh, I fit into the banking sector. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. Okay, good, good. Uh, I'm well. I'm interested to know, as you are in the money sector, what banks do you use and why? <laughs> oh my god, this is gonna show a complete lack of behavioral scientific input. So I have uh, two accounts because I'm, I'm not actually British. Uh, I'm in Dutch. So I've got uh, an account in the Netherlands, which is with Rabobank. And I've got an account in the UK, which is with HSBC. And both of these accounts are simply because they had good offers on when I was a yeah. student. <laughs> so uh, the card was free yes. and it had some money preloaded on it. Uh, at least that's true for HSBC. Uh, Rabobank is because my dad has always banked with Rabobank. Ah. So I just, you know, I got my own card, I think, when I was like 12, which was obviously with right. that bank. It's the family bank, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Do you know what? It's so funny that you, you say the reasons why you set up your current account or your bank account is, well, mine's exactly the same, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's like you shop around for different banks and you find the one that's offering a 16 to 25 rail card and you go, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> I didn't even get that. I, did, I didn't know they oh. offered that. Oh my God, I'm so late to the game. Also, I'm currently 24, so like my option for the 16 to 25 year rail card is soon going to expire. So I should have done better research. Yeah, no, it's it's a bit traumatic. The fact that I'm not going to be able to qualify for the rail card anymore, it's a bit of a sore point. But yeah, uh, it's harsh, isn't it? We're, we're, we're becoming old, but it is what it is. So, but the thing is, I know for a fact that you actually do use uh, one of these online uh, titans or unicorns or whatever the fuck they're called these days. Like yeah. you use Monzo or Revolut, right? Yeah, I use Revolut and I really love it. And I use it for a couple of different purposes. So one of them is to help me budget and manage mm -hmm. money because it gives you some really neat feedback on where you've been spending your money, like a nice little pie chart, which mm -hmm. says, oh God, you've spent 80% spend of your money on food this month, chill out. I mean, it's better than spending 80% <laughs> of your money on booze, right? <laughs> well, I think booze might fall under the food. Um... Oh, that's cheap. That's cheap. They should, yeah. have coded, they should have coded that out better. That's uh, no, that's not that. I'm not impressed. <laughs> I, I think you have control. So the user has control over what purchases fall under oh, and you can okay, create okay. different headings and stuff so you can you can tailor that to you which is really cool so that's one of the reasons why i really like using revolut the other one is that it makes it very easy to send money to different people you know it, i think it's definitely yeah, built yeah. more for that idea where, where you sat around a table at the end of an evening and someone take gets the bill uh, and you want to be able to send them over your portion exactly yeah that's true i feel like we're recording a revolute promo maybe we should move on to other aspects of banking yeah. rather than you know having a debit card that works <laughs> well if revolute do you want to sponsor us yeah fine. i mean oh, revolute hit us up mate like i'm perfectly happy to switch my dormant monzo cards to uh, to yours you know it's, it's all good we're, we're perfectly happy to do that um so yeah i mean that that plug uh, quickly aside but do, do you do much else within the banking system except for, you know, manage your, your spending and saving account? Um, at the moment, I've been spending a bit of time trying to figure out if I have access to a bank account that will offer me any interest mm -hmm. above 0.01%. Probably not. Um, well, I, I think I was quite surprised, actually. I think um, even the difference across, across banks that there are opportunities to earn a bit of interest. I know it's not a lot, but a bit more than 
basically zero mm -hmm. when you when you round it down. Um, and I think that's something that kind of gets me a little bit that it's not so easy just to see all of your options across all the different sure. banks. You know, once once you're in a bank, you're sort of all the services are sort of self contained. And I don't know why I feel like the switching costs for like who you bank with are quite high. I think they are. I, do, I don't think they're like, I mean, I yeah. don't know. I, I think moving your money, I think is free, but it's just the opportunity mm. cost or just the, the cost of the amount of time you need to invest into figuring exactly. out, you know, which bank is best. I think I've read an article. I think it was by the guardian. It was quite a funny article where there was a statistic that British people switched banks less than they switched <laughs> sexual partners. And I was like, that that's a great headline. That's the only headline you need. That's so 100% true. It is. I don't even need to fact yeah, check that. Yeah, you don't need yeah. to fact check that. That is just a fact. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of people are still banking with the bank that they opened up their first student account oh, with. Oh yeah, for sure. So there is a lot of, you know, ground to be gained here. Like there's a lot, I mean, there's a massive literature within behavioral science or behavioral economics on how to make people mm -hmm. spend less and how to make people save more. And, you know, there, there's a bit less uh, successful literature on, you know, how to get people to save for retirement, etc. Or for how, you know, how they can, uh, how you can make people switch banks. But I suppose there is a, you know, there there's ground to cover. There's a there's a battle to be won here. Yeah. And I feel like uh, we can ramble on about, you know, the the many <laughs> behavioral scientific approaches uh, of us and the, to our money. But I feel like it might be best if we actually ask someone who's worked in several different banks, um, <laughs> and who is actually a behavioral scientist to maybe give us the uh, the lowdown of what's what within the banking sector. So with that, I actually am going to introduce our next speaker, who is Natalie Spencer. So take it away, Natalie. So today we are actually talking to Natalie Spencer. So Natalie, as you're probably aware of, during this podcast, we let our guests introduce themselves. So please tell the audience, who are you? What do you do? Where are you from? And what do you want from life? <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Natalie Spencer, and I am a behavioral scientist working in financial services. So my focus is on applying um, BE or behavioral economics to improve financial well-being. Uh, I've worked at banks. I wrote a book, and I have applied uh, behavioral science to create digital features for retail banking apps. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So how did you get into sort of financial well-being? It sounds like a really cool sector. Yeah, so I love it. I had been working at a think tank in London, and what I was doing there was applying a, a BE lens or a behavioral science lens to um, a number of different kind of stubborn problems of the time. So things like the socioeconomic status attainment gap in schools. So that's just the difference between um, uh, the difference in achievement levels between rich students and poor students. Also mm -hmm. looked at things like preventative health and then also looked at financial capability. And this paper was probably the one that really um, made the biggest impact on me. It's also the one that people seemed to um, reach out and talk to me the most about. It's just seemed to resonate the most with the people around me. Um, and then alongside that, I had been invited to write about consumer financial decision making um, for a bank's uh, consumer website. Um, and so I was doing that almost on a monthly basis. And eventually they created a role at that bank for a behavioral scientist. Um, and so that's how I, and then, then I joined them. Yep. <laughs> uh, so that's how I got involved in it. But I think um, for me, banking seemed to be a really important way that I could combine the theory that I had been doing kind of at the think tank with then also starting to apply it to kind of create meaningful impact on people's lives. Um, because what you see is that, you know, even in rich and well-educated regions or countries, um, people are struggling with money. Mm. So, um, 
you know, the, the, the statistics, well, it depends on what research you're looking at, but they all point to um, people really kind of struggling with financial well-being. Um, so like half of Americans worry about running out of money before their next payday, and that's either like occasionally or all of the time. Many Europeans, so six in 10 Europeans are concerned that they won't have enough money for retirement, and over a quarter of Australians have no savings. So, Wow, that's a lot. No savings at all. Exactly. So things like income definitely matter, right? And, and yeah. there are structural elements, you know, uh, wage stagnation, things like that. There are a number of things that matter for financial well-being or financial capability. But we also know that a really big part of this is behavior and habits and decisions. And all of these can be helped by behavioral science. So that's what really um, got me interested in applying BE or behavioral economics to financial well-being. All right. So then I'm quite curious. Did you get into finance first or did you get into the behavioral aspect first? I got into the behavioral aspect first. And actually, and that was even my second career. So, oh. Wow. So, yeah, my my first was um, uh, purchasing and logistics and then kind of like general management back in my early days. And um, and then I read a book by Dan Ariely. I'm sure you guys know it. Uh, Predictably mm -hmm. Irrational. Yeah, yep. of course. I just read it on my commute. <laughs> I'm sure. And this is back in London. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. I just absolutely, you know, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was, you know, excited for my commute so that I could continue reading <laughs> it. And then then I realized, you know, I need to do something about this. Um, I need right. to kind of follow that passion. So I quit my, my job and um, pursued a master's degree at um, Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Yay. Um, Yay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, had had a fabulous time. It was so good. Um, really enjoyed the the problem based learning that they do there. Um, it was a one year program taught in English. It was I, I just absolutely loved it. So that was a great experience. Um, and then I returned back to London after that. And that's when then I got the job at the think tank. To have to return to London from Maastricht, poor you. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah, but it sounds like this this paper you're working on at the think tank was a very formative paper. So Dan Ariely and this paper has sort of led you to where you are today. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yep, mm. yep. I love that. Um, so you talk about financial well being. I find that that's a really interesting. Uh, way of, of thinking about money and what money means to people. So what what does it mean to, you know, have a good sense of financial well-being? What are the things that we can look to and measure, which are sort of good indicators of financial well-being? Yeah, great question. So um, financial well-being is about having, um, it's about being able to meet your obligations for sure, but it's also about having a sense of kind of confidence and control over your finances. Um, and one of the ways that um, that we talk about this actually in that first paper, um, and that was co-authored with Jay Neuber, um, we kind of broke down financial well-being into three components and we called it making ends meet. And that's about making sure that your kind of day-to-day -day obligations are being met, but it's also about, you know, the, the buying the coffees, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, then, then also the resilience to shock. So that's if you have um, an unexpected drop in income or an unexpected expense, are you able to kind of bounce back from that? And then the last one is long-term planning. So that's making sure that you're setting yourself up well for the kind of future that you'd really like to have. Um, and then um, 
when I moved to Australia, I heard much catchier phrases for those three <laughs> things, um, right. which might be are kind of a helpful, um, helpful catchphrases. So you can think about financial well-being as um, being about the everyday, the rainy day and the one day. Oh, I love that. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Much, much catchier. Um, but they really get at the same idea. Yeah, the same idea, which is that, you know, you need to be thinking not only about making sure that you can get by to the next pay cycle, um, but you also need to be making sure that you're kind of building up resilience for when things go wrong and also thinking towards the future. And that's complex. You know, that is um, that's a big system of a lot of different types of decisions that you need to make on a day-to-day -day basis that involve um, trade-offs, it involves math, it involves risk, uncertainty, um, you know, and feedback uh, on some of these decisions you're going to be making day-to-day, -day, like do I buy this coffee, yes, no. Um, other <laughs> things, you you only make the decisions once or twice, so things like potentially buying a house, um, and you might not even get feedback on that decision until many years down the line. You know, did you get a good deal on that mortgage? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to know. True. So, so I think that all of this um, really shows how complex financial well-being can be and how difficult money decisions can be. Um, and that's why I think it's an area that is so ripe for applying behavioral science to it. Absolutely. Now I have a bit of a nasty question because obviously financial well-being is very, very positive for the consumer. However, the banking sector in the past years hasn't gained itself the nicest reputation when it comes to caring about consumer well-being. So how can a bank or the banking sector in general actually accommodate financial well-being? Like what? is happening in the banking sector in general, which is pro-consumer? <laughs> yeah, okay, I think it's a really, really important question um, and a really important topic and one that I think gets misunderstood, even mm -hmm. sometimes working within a bank. So it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. And sure. what I mean by that is like helping customers be better off with their finances doesn't necessarily mean giving up profits at all. And in fact, the contrary is true. So you can often find areas of shared value. So win-win opportunities where by improving customer financial well-being, you can also improve the commercials of the bank and um, mitigate risks. Mm -hmm. So. This is really important because I think it it helps to point towards how focusing on financial well-being is actually something that banks should be doing more and more of. But yes, there I think I think the the major aspects here are that customers with better financial well-being are also better customers. Mm -hmm. It's good to hear. It is really good to hear because <laughs> it's, it's, it's always a bit disheartening when, you know, we're talking about situations where sort of the interests and the incentive structures for the people, everyday people versus businesses are, are not quite in alignment. That's always a bit sad. But in this case, it's a good positive story and a good message. So, you know, if if this is the case that actually you know, it's good for banks to have customers who have, you know, very high financial well-being. Are we seeing this play out at the moment? What are banks doing right now to try and increase their consumers' financial well-being? Yeah. So, great question. Um, I think we're definitely seeing behavioral science be applied specifically in PFM or personal financial management. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked before about how money decisions are quite difficult. So I think there's a role to play for for banks to have behavioral science teams who are focusing on the personal financial management aspect and then very relatedly on things like product design. Or you can imagine um, 
if not specific products, then kind of the features or experiences within a digital asset like the website or an app. <laughs> there are sort of two main ways that I guess banks are trying to increase financial well-being, which is sort of the designs of the technology and the interface and the tools that people are using when they're interacting with banks uh, and also providing uh, customers with personal financial management, which has been informed from the sort of behavioral science perspective. That's spot on. Okay, perfect. <laughs> we, we got you. We got you. Great. So given that behavioral science is being applied, which is already good, not not all sector can claim that behavioral science is happening. Uh, I'm thinking back to the interview we had about the information sector, the oh, information gosh, security yeah. sector that was uh, was shocking. But at least with banking, we don't run into this issue. So behavioral science is being applied. Great, good, no standing ovation. Can you give us a, a really good example of like uh, an application of behavioral science in banking, which you thought was, was really, really good or really impressive or hopefully very effective? Yes, absolutely. So, well, what I think is interesting is that behavioral science can be used to improve finances outside of a bank. So it, it doesn't have to be through a bank that it can be used. So um, the examples that come to mind are the workplace and we've seen a lot of interventions to try and support people to um, with their retirement decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so things like the Save More Tomorrow plan by Thaler and Bernardzi, um, the Aged Selfies by Hal Hirschfield and his colleagues. Oh, I, I haven't heard of that one. Oh, haven't you? Aged oh, Selfies. No, it, tell us a bit more. It's What's right. that about? So it's, um, it was a lab study that sh um, asked people to select an amount that they would like to contribute to their retirement fund. And mm -hmm. uh, everybody got shown an image of themselves. And for half of the people, they got shown an image that had been digitally aged. So they had like wow. gray hair and wrinkles <laughs> and all of that, you know, with, with one of those, you know, aging apps, you can do it. Um, yeah. And those who were shown and those who were shown the aged version of themselves uh, contributed to selected a higher amount to contribute to their to their retirement fund than those who had been shown just their present self. And the idea here is that the aged selfie kind of bridged bridged an empathy gap. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it created connection between your present self and your future self. So it helped you be more inclined to support your future self by contributing more to your retirement plan. Wow, that's uh, really cool. Yeah, I, I haven't actually seen that yet applied in the field that I'm aware of, but maybe maybe somebody is doing that. I think it's just a, a really um, cool and interesting idea that has the potential to be impactful. And then probably some of the also very important work around retirement funds is the work on defaults by Bridget Madrian and her colleagues. Mm -hmm. So I think that all of these are ways, if we just, um, to bring it back, these are ways that behavioral science can be used to improve uh, financial well-being that aren't necessarily through a bank, but of course in banking, there's so much cool stuff. And um, I think it's tied back to those two areas that we discussed previously, which were around personal financial management and also product design or like feature design, if you want to call it that. So what kinds of features or experiences could we create in an app to help you? I'll give you some examples. Um, one is around tax time. So um, I've seen uh, a feature which asks customers to pre-commit their tax refund and then helps them follow through with that when, um, when, when you can detect that the payment is received in an account by the tax authority, for example. Um, and so you can ask people to pre-commit their tax refund to either a savings account or to pay down their debt. Um, yeah, or a number of other things. So that's that's great because that uses um, the the behavioral science of both the the pre commitment act, but also then makes it really easy for people to follow through, and that follow through also kind of acts as a reminder as well. So you're hitting kind of a lot of those 
um, behavioral science mechanisms there. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I've seen is offering greater transparency of product benefits and trade-offs. And this helps people select into a better fitting product. And this is, again, one of those examples where it, it definitely leads to shared value. So um, in this particular example, I've seen it in credit cards and the, the product mix got changed. So people selected into a, a different card um, than before the trade-offs were surfaced. You know, when it was only talking about the benefits and none of the right. things that might you might have to consider. Yeah. But it also led to higher spending, but f no more cases of defaults or arrears. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. The, providing greater transparency of the product benefits and trade-offs helped people to pick a product that suited their needs and their spending better. Hmm. So, sorry, I'm just I'm interested in this this result where people actually ended up spending more. Do you, is that sort of reflective of the fact that people potentially had more confidence? How are we supposed to interpret this result? Because it, it is quite interesting, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is what we believe to be the case, but we would have to do some more research into it. So first step was finding the result, and then, <laughs> right, and then yeah. um, we'd have to we'd have to probe a little bit more deeply into exactly why that is. But mm -hmm. yeah, the the belief is that that is exactly what has happened so that people feel like this is a better fitting product for them and that it suits their spending needs. No, absolutely. I'm actually quite curious. So we've mentioned confidence and, and overconfidence already, uh, especially with the previous paper, as well as, as spending goes up because we, we assume that people get more comfortable or more confident with these methods. But is, isn't this a sign of, of overconfidence rather than confidence? I mean, if spending goes up, that, that tends to be, you know, okay as long as it is within limits. But as soon as it's no longer within limits, it's probably not a good idea. And as you've raised this point as well, with some people being financially not so well, but still having this, this confidence or almost this overconfidence, what, what happens more? Uh, do you think people tend to be more overconfident or do you think most people tend to be uh, quite anxious, whereas there, there's no real reason to be anxious? Because overconfidence is a massive topic in the finance literature or the behavioral finance literature, I should say. Yeah. So I think um, I don't know which which happens more, whether it's more anxiety or more overconfidence. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that what, you know, your comment just now, what it really highlights is that that financial well-being is not one specific thing. You know, it, it does, it is comprised of many different metrics. And while overconfidence is certainly an issue, you can imagine that a little bit of confidence might be also related to things like self-efficacy and, and, and other, other aspects that could be very beneficial for your, both your subjective financial well-being, but also objectively. Yeah, that's a very fair point. I suppose if you, if you don't have any confidence in your ability to deal with your finances, I suppose it's downhill from there. Exactly. And you might not, you might not take any action at all yeah, so I think there's definitely a balance in here somewhere. Yeah. And actually, I, I've been thinking about that more generally, too. I have been thinking that one of the things that's difficult about, about helping people with their financial well-being is that there are many cases when the, the action to be taken is, how, how do I say this right? It would be much easier if you could just give people blanket statements like do X more or do Y less. But sure. I feel like spending is kind of like eating. Oh. And you don't want people to overeat, but they mm -hmm. can't undereat either. So you can't just say um, limit your calories and just eat as, as little as possible because you can't survive like that. And the same is with spending. You can't just tell people don't spend on anything because actually there are some times when spending is going to help you in the long run as well. 
So mm-hmm. you can imagine if you're spending money to um, invest in your education, for example, or to retrain, which then might help you get an, a, a different job in the future, things like that. And yeah. so it, it again, it's just one of those ways in which financial well-being is a, kind of a big construct and mm. um, has a lot of different parts to it. And so the way that you can, that I think that banks can best support customers is by um, not only having kind of a series of different interventions or nudges within its services, but also by kind of being able to think through how those different interventions can all be woven together or stitched together in a way that then makes sense for an individual person given their circumstances and what their kind of goals and objectives are. It won't be easy. It won't be easy to do that, but but that's where I I see behavioral science in banks tending towards. Yeah, it's it's a really challenging problem. I I I like to call it the Goldilocks problem. You know, you have to get it just right. You know, too much advice one way or the other is is not necessarily going to lead to better outcomes, maybe even lead to some unintended consequences. And and you're right, it's an incredibly highly complex individualized problem. And it would be all so much more simple if you could just give people simple, actionable advice that they could take uh, and apply. I was just going to say, but that is really important as well. So I think it, mm-hmm. it's not an either or, it's an and. So yes, give right. people simple, actionable advice, for sure. Absolutely. Do that. Um, but where I am really interested in in seeing this move towards is um, is something called just in time adaptive interventions, which essentially is just saying rather than give kind of a blanket statement to everyone mm-hmm. or a, a blanket nudge or intervention mm-hmm. to everyone, um, how can you how can you surface the right intervention to the right person at the right time, you know, when they're going right. to be receptive to that as well. Um, mm-hmm. And you can do that through either looking at data or asking them. So, you, so if we think about looking at data, this might be looking at, you know, if they have any payment dishonors or uh, what their balance is relative to their spending or lots of things like that. Or it could be looking at um, what kind of pages they have visited on the their like online banking or in their app beforehand, um, and that might give you an indication of like, hmm, if they've looked at this tool, maybe they uh, want to achieve this job, and then how can we uh, how can we help them? Um, execute that job as quickly as possible, for example. Or you could just ask them, you know, you can surface something in an app and ask a customer a question. And then based on what their answer to that question is, then surface up one nudge versus a different nudge. Yeah, all in the service of improving their financial well-being. Mm, Interesting. So from a competition perspective, uh, banks, what banks, in my opinion, uh, should worry a bit more in terms of competition is uh, the new type of banking apps, such as Monzo and Revolut, to just uh, mention a couple. Um, these apps are very heavily grounded in behavioral science. With the with Monzo, I know for a fact that the app was started by at least one person who worked with behavioral science just, you know, with, within a team. Is this... Uh, is, is this challenging the traditional banking system? Does this uh, make traditional banks uh, need to up their game? Are you worried? <laughs> so what neobanks can't compete on is uh, trust and stability. So even though I know that big banks don't have the, the best reputation lately, Um, Mm -hmm. Even still, when it comes down to it, a lot of research finds that people still trust the bigger banks um, more (laughs) for the safety of their money. So neobanks can't really compete on on trust or stability, but what they have been competing in is really good UX, um, Mm -hmm. so user experience, and really good uh, PFM, personal financial management. So 
traditional banks for sure, I think are, you know, ha have their ear to the ground and um, are realizing that they need to be more than transactional. Mm -hmm. They also need to be helpful along these, um, along these lines. So with really good user experience and really good personal financial management. So there's definitely a trend towards this. Um, and if you look at some of the industry rankings, so for example, um, Forrester uh, or other kinds of, of industry rankings like that, um, mm -hmm. you'll see that the highest ranked banking apps often also have very strong uh, personal financial management element to it, mm -hmm. as well as, as things like experience, you know, how easy is it to, to get the job done that you've come to the app to do. Mm. So, sorry, I'm just, I'm interested in this personal financial management on these apps. What what does that look like? Is that just giving people feedback about what they spent money on in the past month? Or is it a bit more in depth than that? It can look like a number of different things. But generally, it's about giving people a view of, of how much they have spent or saved more so than just traditionally like a list of your different accounts, right? And then a balance right. there. So it's mm -hmm. somehow, if you think of traditional apps as providing not only the transaction ability, but also information, then I would say that the PFM element turns the information into more like insights, you know? So it, oh, okay. it, um, it presents the information back to you in a way that is potentially more meaningful or helps you to answer some questions. Um, and then there are also things like the different features that it might have. So some of these things that we were talking about before, things like goal setting or adding friction. So things like locks, blocks, and limits. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting area and one that I would like to see even more work being done in there. So, you know, standard economics would say that restricting choice and liquidity would not be preferred. But from behavioral science, we know that sometimes we actually just really want more restriction to help us with self-control. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work by John Bashirs and his colleagues on this. So that is really important. You can imagine it being applied to things like gambling, but also any kind of spending where you might kind of feel like you can't really trust your your <laughs> <laughs> I know where this is going. I know exactly where this is going. From a, from personal experience, uh, I can argue, yeah. I can say with great conviction that putting a limit on my spending of makeup is always a good idea. <laughs> 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 so so taken together all, all of these different things so presenting information in a way that's really meaningful to, to customers and then plus having some sort of other features i think um together those those make up uh, personal financial management in a lot of the the um kind of award-winning banking apps i would say okay so is that the future of behavioral science being applied to banking then I think that that's that's the very near term future. Can I say that? Okay. Like that is yeah. yeah, that that's happening right now. I think okay. the future is building on that to um, do a number of different things. So one is these just in time adaptive interventions that I had mentioned before. So that's about mm -hmm. moving away from kind of blanket nudges towards getting really personalized, yep. always in the service of the customer. So always in the service of financial well-being. But yeah, getting really kind of personalized and being able to provide um, tailored experiences um, for, for a person in the app. I think that's the future. I think mm -hmm. also looking beyond just discrete decision points. So you know, there are a number of different decisions that customers need to make. And mm -hmm. what behavioral science is really excellent at is going deep on each one of those kind of decision nodes, if you like, or decision points. And mm -hmm. where I think the future is, is for behavioral science to team up with um, disciplines like service design or human-centered design, mm -hmm. and to be able to, to really get clear on how these different individual decision nodes are stitched together or woven together so that you get the bigger picture as well. And that that way, 
individual decision points don't inadvertently counteract a different decision point. Mm -hmm. And similarly, that way, like a customer interacting with a bank, let's say, they're going to get a kind of a similar-ish experience regardless of what touch point they have with the bank at that at that particular right. time. So it's making right. a more cohesive um, a more cohesive experience for customers and making it so that the different decision points are mutually reinforcing for each other. So that's another big area. And then I'd say the last area that I think is the future of behavioral science in banking is that there's already been a lot of work uh, supporting kind of the everyday side and also on the one day side. Um, mm -hmm. So that's about like our day to day stuff and then also planning for the future. So things like investing pennies per day framing or mm -hmm. um, supporting people for those kinds of investment decisions or retirement decisions. And so where I think that we will see much more work is on the rainy day resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be around Yes, things like an emergency buffer, but also around ensuring the things that you can't afford to lose and maybe mm -hmm. even finding ways of kind of future proofing your your income or future proofing your skills um, and your support networks, things like that. So I think that insurance is a really, really interesting space here and to really understand what's the right level of coverage for someone. You know, it, it's definitely a kind of a prime example of a behavioral uh, a behavioral science situation for people. Mm -hmm. So you have people paying money up front for, which is for certain, for a future uncertain benefit. And that future uncertain benefit is even, it's like a less worse outcome. <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> like if a disaster happens, you mm -hmm. won't be as bad off as you would have been. So I think that while it is kind of buying peace of mind, I just think that there's so much room for a really uh, for a lot of interesting work to support customer decision making in the space of insurance. So I'd say those three areas are really the future of behavioral science. Yeah. Well, that's very that's, well said. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a lot of information. That, that's very, very clear. Now, we always have this this massively unfair question, uh, especially if you've just given us such a such an excellent you know, reading <laughs> into the future. But our question is always, so when it comes to behavioral science and banking specifically, what is the main thing that you want listeners to take away from this episode? So after we've already been taking, like, talking <laughs> for about an hour, <laughs> what's actually the key <laughs> message? Okay. Um, I Can I give you two key messages? Sure. Go on then. <laughs> sure. Okay. So for a non-behavioral economist listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. um, I'd say the take home is that you want to make sure that the bank that you're banking with, um, A, has a behavioral science team or, or at least a person in it, and mm -hmm. that B, that that team or person is really focused on customer outcomes and following ethical, ethical standards or ethical imperatives. Um, and I think you need them both together because one is kind of the, the method or, or the competence and the other one is the intent. So you want to make sure that um, the products and features are being designed for real humans, but also um, to support the best outcomes for those real humans. So All right. that would be for, for the non-behavioral economists listening. Mm -hmm. um, for the behavioral economists who are listening who might want to get involved in um, banking, I would say that um, there's so much opportunity here. This is definitely an area um, which I would encourage people to um, get more involved in. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that in summary, you should be looking for the, the kind of win-win shared value opportunities. Um, and you should be pairing up with um, designers and data scientists as well. And I would say to push into those kind of more complex areas um, to try and create larger scale, more persistent behavior change. 
Well, fantastic. I mean, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you, Natalie. I could pick your brain all day. I've got so many questions, <laughs> um, but I know we're only restricted to the hour. So just to say thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak to us. And this is your moment to plug yourself and uh, anything you've got going on in your life right now. If the listener wants to keep up to date with you and your progress uh, in behavioral science in the banking and financial industry, where can they find you? Uh, well, thank you so much this was so much fun it was it was a really enjoyable hour um, if people want to find me they can find me on LinkedIn um, uh, or on Twitter I'm at economic logic uh, on Twitter um, and in terms of stuff that's going on in my life I recently published a book called good money and it's all about behavioral science and financial well-being um, and it's published in a few different languages so if you'd like to pick that up that would be great Cool. Excellent. Good plug. <laughs> yeah, nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. So that was our conversation with Natalie. Thank you so much, Natalie, for taking the time to speak to us. I thought that was uh, a really cool discussion. Mala, what was your main takeaway from our conversation? I suppose my main takeaway is, is something that I've always already kind of known but is that it's actually really quite difficult to to make general interventions when it comes to people managing their money so whether it's for their spending their saving or their uh, retirement saving or investing or whatever um, because as Natalie said it is quite important to tailor uh, interventions because not everyone wants the same thing and not everyone relates to money the same way. I mean, I I am like involved with my money like almost obsessively, right. uh, which is why I started also a blog about it. And I uh, yeah may maybe I should stop. Maybe it's becoming an issue. But some people they just they get their wage paid in and they know they have some outgoings and they, and then maybe they have some money put away in investment on someone else's advice, but they're really passive about it and. Of course, the type of interventions that work for someone who's like super passive are not going to be the same type of interventions that are going to work for someone like me. And I suppose right. that does bring an, uh, a layer of, of added complexity to the whole thing, which I think is important to address. Oh, for sure. Um, I, I felt a lot of, of my trauma come to the surface <laughs> after after learning about behavioral health interventions for the last three years mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of similarities in the fact that you know health and money decisions are very individualized um, mm -hmm. there's loads of factors internal and external uh, that affect the way people you know perceive and think and hold beliefs and those can interact uh, in in interesting and unpredictable ways with uh, interventions, behavioral interventions. So it's it's a very complex problem, uh, mm -hmm. but it sounds like we're moving in the right direction in, a, in the sense that we need to be focusing on the individual and understanding, understanding the aspects of the individual decision making in order to try and tailor uh, interventions to best suit them. No, absolutely. How we do that is 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 the real question yeah but, um i think in general natalie mentioned the the fact i mean i always thought you know it's there is a there is this both in health and in wealth which is a is a great tagline health and wealth um mm. to describe the both of us because it's effectively what we're studying but within <laughs> yeah it is no so but within both the health and wealth there seems to be like these these ideals so for health it's like you need to be under a certain fat percentage or have a certain bmi or exercise this amount per week or whatever and within wealth is actually quite similar where you know you need to have a certain amount set aside for savings or you need to have savings to begin with and a certain amount needs to be hmm. invested or you should definitely look into investing and then this is the age by which you should have a retirement fund yada 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 like there are very clear ideals but i think it's it's interesting to note that those ideals aren't gonna be the same for a lot of people and that might be a cultural difference or most definitely an age difference maybe even a gender difference some people need to calculate in for kids some don't that's again both health and wealth because you know it's right. it's gonna cost your health if you want to have a child like it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, a tra it's a traumatic experience for the body if you're the female carrying the baby anyway this is a complete tangent oh, yeah complete tangent <laughs> Moving back to the argument, 
But I think it's interesting yeah. that within banking, at least they're they're moving away from this idea of you just need to have money in the bank and no debt mm. or, or you know whatever, uh, and rather they're moving to a slightly more financial well being. Um, yes approach i I think that's i good. really like that yeah that's like a more holistic approach yeah. we hope you enjoyed this episode we thought <laughs> we yes. hope that it was thought-provoking for you too um if you have any ideas or thoughts that maybe sprung from listening to this we'd love to hear them so please join in the conversation on social media or on twitter facebook linkedin or wherever you'd like to go i'm i'm sure uh, we'll do our best to answer will be there uh, but i guess that's it for us for this week thank you guys so much for listening uh well done for making it to the end there is no mm-hmm. prize uh Sorry. just personal pride so uh you can you can take that home uh but yeah we uh we will be launching a new episode next week as normal so uh yeah listen out for us until then see you have ya. a good week guys bye You're the dummy that don't believe in science All your projects always be denying You're the one to love, you're the one I wanna give